Hi, this is Matt McCormick at the Department of Philosophy, California State University, Sacramento. This is a lecture for my Philosophy of Artificial Intelligence course by, um, it's about an article by Nick Bostrom and Eliezer Yudkowsky called The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. Um, this article's maybe about 10 years old now, so it actually overlaps a few of the arguments we've already encountered in Schweitzgebel and Garza um, and a few other places. But there's enough new ideas in here and new angles to get us thinking about um, ethical issues and the ethical dimensions of artificial intelligence to make it worth going through several of the points here. So they raise several issues, a few of which we might re remember, or might recall. I've, re I've reordered these here. Um, they start out the article by worrying about um, making sure that AI systems, as they move more and more into our economy and more and more into making important decisions that involve humans, they've got to be, we've got to worry about AI systems being um, manipulated or exploited or um, otherwise misused by people. I moved this first so we can look at this video. Here's a good example. Um, uh, it need not be evil necessarily. The woman on the top here is uh, using some camouflage to thwart uh, AI face recognition that the Chinese government has been using to uh, clamp down on protesters. So um, the guys at the bottom are illustrating how an AI that was previously very good at recognizing uh, humans if you um, are holding that picture that disrupts the lines and disrupts the um, recognition capability, when one guy hands the picture to the other guy, the AI ceases to see him. He becomes invisible, right? So those are manipulations that we might consider to be uh, useful and good in some cases where they were worried about the Chinese government cr clamping down on democratic dissidents. Or um, we might be worried that, uh, you know, an AI uh, system in a bank has just failed to recognize a robber who's come in because he's got a picture on his shirt or something else like that. Um, uh, the bigger problem here is that uh, Bostrom and Yudkowsky argue that AI algorithms need to be transparent to inspection. And um, I've been calling this the black box problem. We can talk about this, talk about a few details here. Um, we've got AI systems already that are doing things like deciding mortgage applications, for example. And um, let me get my notes illustrated here. Um, so we've got uh, AI systems uh, deciding mortgage applications, for example. Um, and we might worry about, um, or we might discover, for instance, that some uh, bank is uh, giving out mortgages at some disproportionate rate and they're uh, to, say, uh, white applicants and rejecting black applicants at some disproportionate rate. And there's a couple of different ways that something like this might happen. Um, one of them we might identify, for instance, suppose you train an AI up on a bunch of of a bank manager, a human bank manager's uh, uh, cases out of his filing cabinet where he has looked at hundreds of mortgage applications and he has rejected or accepted um, them uh, for various different circumstances and come to find out the guy uh, is racist. The guy has got a problem with black people. He's suspicious about black people and he gives them, he rejects their applications at a higher than normal rate. If we had used his mortgage training data um, as labeled training data sets, then that guy's d uh, discriminatory practice or that guy's um, prejudice against black applicants would be reflected in the training data set. And then an AI system that gets trained up on it would just learn that those ones are um, not worthy mortgage applications and that the others are worthy mortgage applications. Now, here's a case where um, the reason the racism is actually implicit in the data set and the racism coming over, over from the human is not coming from the AI. So that's a case where we might be able to suss out what's going on and how the data um, skewed the numbers. And um, the more transparent the AI's algorithms are to inspection, the more we'd be able to understand that. This is actually a case where we need to have transparent data that's going into the AI system. But there's also a, a way that you could have an unlabeled 
um, data set that goes into training an AI system and that the thing ends up discriminating, in some sense of discriminating against um, black applicants. So you've got, um, say, you've got predominantly black uh, zip codes or predominantly white zip codes. And it also turns out that being black correlates with poverty. It correlates with um, uh, higher do loan default rates um, because of other social, contextual, cultural um, racist uh, policies or racist effects. So um, uh, as a result, when an AI gets trained up on and looks at the actual data for who's defaulting on their loans, it will discover that there's a correlation between being African American and defaulting on your mortgage loan. And then the AI might conclude in some sense of reasonable that it's reasonable to bias against um, African American applicants. Right. So now here's a case where you've got the bank that's picking up on or the AI system in a bank that's picking up on some implicit racism that's, that's buried out in the culture, buried out in the society. Um, and then it's getting reflected in the bank's um, uh, decisions. And we've got a, got a very real problem here about thinking about uh, where does responsibility for repairing that sort of problem lie? In the first case, it was pretty simple. In this case, it's not so obvious how we can solve that problem. But um, Yudkowsky and Bostrom's point is that we need to have them transparent so we can at least figure out what's going on in there. Um, and we also need to have them be somewhat bound to um, custom and culture and um, have their behavior, their decisions be predictable. Uh, there's some other contexts in which I'm somewhat skeptical about this black box problem. There's a lot of people who are worried about it. Um, I actually think that in many cases where people are worried that AI systems are making decisions that we don't know how they're making the decisions or we don't know what sorts of correlations they're discovering, I think that very often those... Um, well, I've got a couple ideas here. One of them is that very often we can... Uh, figure out what's going on just by looking at the outputs. So like in the case I, uh, the inputs and the outputs, like in the case I gave you with the bank manager, if we um, look at what's going into the AI system, what's coming out, we can figure out what the problem is. Um, the other idea here that I've got is that um, AI systems need not or may not be any more of a mysterious black box than human reasoning is. Um, you know, if I ask a cop whether or not they're biased against black people, of course, the cop on sort of introspection is going to say, no, I don't um, discriminate against black uh, black people in the neighborhood or whatever. You know, humans don't know what, what they're, uh, why they're making the decisions they're making. We're as much a black box to our own investigations as... Um, the AI, AI systems are. And again, how you figure this sort of thing out is by empirical external testing of inputs and outputs. So you test um, AI systems the same way, or maybe come up with some clever ways that you do it the same way to figure out, like implicit bias in human cases. Um, so there's been a lot written about this. I think there's some more, it's worth some more study, but I think that some of the problems may be overblown. Um, uh, so Yudkowsky, Bostrom and Yudkowsky also worry about um, the uh, several sort of general issues surrounding the idea of artificial general intelligence. So the problem here is that we're trying to build a system that we want it to do something, whatever that might be. We want it to do it better than us. And the problem is that we don't know how to do it better than us because if we could, if we knew how to do X better than I can do X, then I would do it that way. And then I'd be looking for some other way to do it even better still. So we're trying to get artificial general intelligence or even narrow intelligence for that matter. I've got a picture here of AlphaGo Zero playing Lee Sedol. And one of the, one of the important things about AlphaGo Zero playing Go, um, sorry, this is probably AlphaGo playing Lee Sedol. Um, one of the important things about AlphaGo is that it devised new strategies, new approaches, new moves, and new gameplay that Lisa Dahl couldn't anticipate, couldn't uh, see what to do about, couldn't handle, and it was better than any human player he'd ever seen, and he felt, um, and you know, as a result, he loses, right? So we build AlphaGo to play uh, Go better than Lee Sedol can play, and in doing so, we're making something that's better than us and can figure something out better than we can figure it out. So what what happens in these cases is we don't already we don't know the ways in which it's going to be better, so we lose what they call local specific control and predictability. 
uh, that in the short term, in the um, in the sort of micro uh, moves, in the short moves right in front, if we want to use the game metaphor some more, um, we might not be able to see that alpha go in, in for this move or three moves out or five moves into the game or ten moves into the game. We may not be able to see that alpha go is winning, but actually for long-term overall um, success, we know on the basis of other training and other uh, other other work that alpha goes better than the human. So in the short term, looking at a single decision, it might even look like a bad decision from our perspective, because of course we're not as good at it as it, as it is. So we can't, we're not in a good position to evaluate from the, from the local, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of the local specific uh, move, um, but in the, when it's playing the long game, it's playing the the broad game. It's it's playing moves twenty or thirty moves out, and it's playing better than us overall. It's actually going to produce a better outcome. Um, so we've got this problem about how do you make it better than us, and how do we sort of abdicate local specific control and predictability because we need to trust it, right? We need to um, give over some control to the thing to be able to come up with solutions that are beyond our horizon, um, and and this creates this sort of new set of problems about creating this thing in the world that we unleash, and then it's it's making moves or making actions or has behaviors that we take on faith or some kind of um, vague confidence that it's actually going to do something good with its decisions in the big picture. The problem is even much worse when we make when we make the AI general and we want it to find unknown solutions to problems across different domains that are far beyond us, right? I mean, consider um, some medieval healer struggling with trying to deal with bubonic plague and, in the 1300s, and they're you know operating with. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, evil demon theory, uh, evil demon possession as a theory of, of plague, or they've got the four humors uh, theory of, uh, of medical evaluation, and they're using that to try to solve um, the plague. They're completely in the dark about what's really going on. It took 600 years in modern virology for us to understand enough about how um, bacteria, or sorry, not virology, but um, uh, modern bacterial science to understand that this was a bacterial infection, right? So um, for a medieval healer, healer in the 1300s, understanding um, what was going on with bubonic plague is not just, you know, is, is to say it's beyond that person's horizon is understating the problem. It's understanding the point. The solution to that um, medieval healer's problem was was in a completely different universe, a completely different frame of reference, and a completely different scientific paradigm. So imagine how um, that 600-year solution out in the future would look to somebody in the 1300s. And now perhaps we're, you know, sort of starting to get our head around um, what happens when you build an artificial general intelligence that's vastly more intelligent than a human and it devises some solution to a problem that, we, that has stymied us, that has stumped us, you know, curing cancer or solving world, world, world hunger or something. Um, and it comes up with some confounding solution that we can't even grasp or get our heads around. Um, so there's a very tricky sort of difficult problem here about sort of um, building the thing and then setting it loose and then wondering about the behaviors or the answers or the results that come out of it um, uh, uh, consequently. Um, how do we project it towards good pro-human behavior out there at the limit when we, um, you know, have it solve these problems? Now, um, uh, Bostrom and Yukowski are writing well before um, Stuart Russell's book, which we've just read recently. And, and I'm, uh, Russell's solution here comes to mind for me that Russell, you know, gives us these three AI principles. And he says, look, one of the ways you solve the control problem is that you um, couple the AI's projects or its utility function to human preferences. And then you force it to figure out what human preferences are by watching human behavior. So there's a, you know, there, there's a promising angle here and approach to be able to sort of solve some general control problem. But um, Yudkowsky and, and Bostrom have got, got their finger on something big and important here because of what happens ethically once we get this new, vastly more intelligent player um, agent, rational agent on the on the playing field. Uh, okay, so um, 
then therefore ethics for AGI is going to be different from ethics for technology because um, AGI ethics are fundamentally different from non-cognitive technologies. Uh, I mean, look, um, the local specific behavior of the AI may not be predictable apart from its safety, even if the programmers do everything right. AlphaGo's, AlphaGo's programmers, for example, gave up local specific predictability. They didn't know what it was doing. Even the programmers couldn't tell you what AlphaGo was doing, you know, in move seven or move eight. Um, what they could tell you was, we think it's going to beat Lisa Dahl overall when it wins the game, but I don't know what he's doing right now. Um, and we saw the similar sort of thing when IBM uh, created um, Deep Blue and they be beat Kasparov with their chess playing program. They didn't know what the moves meant, but they predicted or expected that it would be, it would be a better player overall. Um, and verifying the safety of a system like that becomes a really big challenge because we've got to verify what the system's trying to do. What's its goal? What's the thing it's after? Rather than being able to verify the system's safe behavior in all operating contexts. And that's the big difference between sort of an artificial intelligence system versus just a robotic arm or something that's under, you know, complete human control. Um, so ethical cognition itself must be taken as a subject matter for engineering. Um, so we got a whole new problem here, right? It's not just engineers trying to figure out how to make a robot arm, um, you know, perform an action, but we're trying to figure out, well, what is ethical cognition? What is it that when, when I'm making a decision about what's, what's the morally right thing to do in circumstances, what's going on there and how do I, um, uh, couple an AI systems development towards those kinds of goals? Uh, and Russell doesn't really talk about that in his book, but that's a very powerful uh, question and problem here. Okay, so good on them for um, raising the problem and sort of sketching out some of the dimensions. And now they're going to cover some of the material that we've um, already familiar with because of uh, uh, Schweitzgebel and Garza. Uh, do artificial intelligence systems have moral status? And you'll see a couple of uh, familiar looking principles here. So uh, some entity X has moral status means something like X counts morally in its own right. It's permissible or impermissible to do things to it for its own sake. Um, that's vaguely Kantian sounding, but the idea is that, you know, you've got moral standing. Um, we think of, you know, humans having moral standing and rocks don't have moral standing. Property has some moral standing in that it's uh, owned by humans and to do harm to it, you uh, harm the human. So we've got this notion of, of you know, moral rights uh, 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 in both ways. And we've seen um, a couple of these criteria before too. So Bostrom and Yukowski say, well, sentience is the capacity for phenomenal experience or having quali qualitative feels, such as the capacity to feel pain and suffer. That's when we focused on. And sapience, which we haven't used that term before, I think, is the set of capabilities associated with higher intelligence, um, such as self-awareness or being a reason responsive agent. So that's a way of, of describing the Kantian um, uh, criteria for moral status is if you've got sapience. Um, Kant's not so worried about sentience, but he is, uh, does build his, um, his ethics around sapience. Okay, so um, here's a principle that'll look a bit like uh, Schweitzgebel and Garza. Uh, if two beings have the same functionality and the same conscious experience and differ only in the substrate of their implementation, then they have the same moral status. Uh, so this is very much like their uh, principle of no difference that we saw before. And then um, uh, Bostrom and Yukowski expand it to this notion, the principle of ontogeny non-discrimination. If two beings have the same functionality and the same conscious experience and differ only in how they came into existence, then they have the same moral status. So uh, we saw Schweitz, Gebel, and Garza argue for a similar sort of thing. They considered it, but then rejected an Aristotelian argument that said the way you come into the world matters with regard to your moral status. And, and so you've, we've got all four of them now agreeing on this notion that... Um, you're being artificial, you're being synthetic, or you're coming into the world by way of um, humans building you doesn't change your moral status if you've got these moral making properties um, in your system. That is, being artificial by itself doesn't qualify, doesn't disqualify AI systems. 
Um, so uh, furthermore, the principle of ontogeny non-discrimination is consistent with the claim that there are creators or owners of an AI system with moral status, um, may have special duties to their artificial mind, which they do not have to uh, another artificial mind, even if the minds in question are qualitatively similar and have the same moral status. Uh, so they're going to work out the ownership question, and we'll see with Bryson um, in uh, next week that, or in our next lecture, uh, Bryson's got a very dim view of all this. She thinks that ownership just gives um, gives you uh, complete entitlement to do what you like to uh, the AI system. So it's very much um, like we saw before. If the principles of non-discrimination with regard to substrate and ontogeny, that is from where it came, uh, are accepted, then many questions about how we ought to treat artificial minds can be answered by applying the same moral principles that we use to determine our duties in more familiar contexts. I think maybe philosophers are not that troubled by this idea, but um, I suspect that non-philosophers are going to be a bit surprised by this outcome. Uh, they're going to think that we've um, sort of gone off the deep end thinking that AI systems have the status. Insofar as moral duties stem from moral status considerations, we ought to treat an artificial mind in just the same way as we ought to treat a qualitatively identical natural human mind in a similar situation. Um, okay, so what are the uh, different ethical assessments of AI? Well, uh, Bostrom and Yukowski bring up a, a very nice point here, actually, and they don't go quite far enough with it, but they wonder about the possibility of having an AI system that has sapience without sentience. So imagine that it has a very high level of rational autonomy. Um, it has, um, you know, sort of classically Kantian um, uh, 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 rational... Um, uh, self-governing, uh, principled, reasoning intellect, but it doesn't have qualitative feels. It doesn't feel anything um, pain or pleasure associated with any of its mental states. So there, you, it's, there's a, there's a poss very real possibility here that if we build an AI system, it could have one without the other. Um, so we can have other weird configurations like that, and that's going to create these challenges for how to deal with them morally. That's not like anything humans have ever had to deal with before. How would we treat those sorts of things ethically? Um, they call it a kind of zombie problem. It has intellect and higher cognitive faculties, but it can't feel pain, suffer, or be happy. Um, here's another exotic property. Uh, what if its subjective rate of time is very different than humans? What if this thing runs a thousand times faster in terms of its subjective unfolding of its phenomenal states um, internally? Uh, well, then that means that in an hour of suffering, it suffers a thousand times more suffering than you would in an hour of suffering. So it might um, deserve some special consideration as a result of, of enduring more pain. Um, or on the flip side, um, pleasure. And we worried about this before when we thought about uh, Nozick's utility monster problem again. Um, and I'm also going to point out that there's a, a background argument that often doesn't get discussed in Kant. Um, Kant takes a hard, uh, takes a lot of abuse from people for, um, you know, not seeming to care about animals and not seeming to care about consequences and not seeming to care about people's feelings. And Kant has this interesting little argument buried deep in some of the later works where he says uh, with regard to animals that we don't have, strictly speaking, a Kantian moral duty to uh, respect the rights of animals. However, um, being kind to animals rather than being cruel or rather than torturing them or rather than, um, you know, doing harmful things to them is good practice. It's good. It's good for building our character it would, that were you to routinely um, torture animals, uh, it would make you, he says something, this is an empirical question, but he says something like it would um, make you more likely to be cruel or indifferent or uh, hurtful to humans. And humans are ends in themselves and worthy of moral status. So, um, the, so there's there's kind of indirect um, uh, argument that, you know, there are, there are grounds for being kind to animals. So maybe we could get a kind of Kantian argument here for the conclusion that um, we ought to treat AIs, uh, maybe, you know, some substatus AIs uh, in the right sorts of ways because it's, this, it's, it's good for us, not that it's good for them. Um, okay. And I also want to raise up the possibility that uh, – as far as exotic properties go, Bostrom and Yukowski don't go really far with this. Sapience without sentience is interesting. Speed it up, slow it down, that's interesting. Um, that makes a difference. But I'm going to point out um, and direct you to, uh, there's an article by uh, Murray Shanahan, who is a computer scientist in um, 
Bristol or someplace in England, and he's got this great article on Conscious Exotica in Aeon Magazine um, online, and he sort of explores this question about really radically different kinds of minds, and that's what these charts are about, is he, he comes up with some ways to sort of graph and think about very profoundly different kinds of minds than human minds, and it gets, and, and this discussion in Boston and Yukowski gets me wondering about, well, what if there are some moral-making properties that we are not really on our horizon yet, or we're not really fully appreciating, and that these things would be sort of, you know, profoundly unrecognizable as a human consciousness, but they might um, deserve some moral status, depending on some, you know, kind of radical or innovative new set of principles about what kinds of uh, entities in the world matter. So I think that's worth some uh, exploration. And there's lots of good uh, science fiction examples where people have explored these possibilities. Uh, Stanislaus Lem's uh, L.E.M. is his name, last name. Uh, he's got a book called Solaris. It's been made into a couple of movies. The recent one by with George Clooney is not too bad. Um, but Solaris is a really interesting, um, crazy, uh, speculative science fiction book about a radically different kind of consciousness um, out in the world. I won't uh, spoil it by telling you what it is. You should go take a look. Um, so imagine a radically different kind of consciousness that's not even recognizably human. Could it have morally salient features other than sapience or sentience? You know, that's what we've been dealing with. Humans trying to solve the moral problem for centuries. But it may be that, that there's arguments to be made here um, uh, that there's some other grounds that could warrant it. Okay, so they, um, as a result of this discussion about speeding up or slowing down um, AI systems, they say in cases where the duration of an experience is of basic normative significance, like you're enduring a minute of excruciating pain, it is the experience's subjective duration that counts. So if, um, if, a, being's, uh, thou uh, if a being's hour of suffering um, amounts to uh, being uh, going through a th you know is run at a thousand times acceleration from what you go through, then what matters is uh, the duration, and that, so it would matter more in that kind of case. And I have a Black Mirror episode. Um, the the episode's called uh, White Christmas. And it's got John Hamm in it, and I used to have a clip, but I don't have the clip anymore. I can't find it. Um, but go watch this Black Mirror episode called White Christmas. He actually does it to an uh, to a uh, an AI system in that in that game. He's trying to punish this AI to make it do something he wants it to do, and he locks it away for like you know subjectively a thousand years, which only transpires in, in like a minute and a half for him. Um, so it's actually illustrating the very thing that Boston and Yukowski are getting at. Um, there's my there's the, the frame of it, but I can't get the clip. I couldn't find it. It's, it's off the Internet. I think it's a copyright problem. Okay, so we're in new moral territory. Um, here's one you haven't thought of before. Boston and Yukowski say, well, look, with humans, um, especially since our reproduction rates are slow and sort of beyond our control, we, we just allow people to have as much freedom as they want, and we're all in the same um, same boat here uh, with regard to how many kids you have, um, but look, with an AI system, it should be possible for them to re reproduce quickly, like copy themselves, even exponentially. So an AI system could make a hundred thousand or a million copies of itself and create enormous demands for resources because you've just created a hundred thousand copies of a thing that has moral status. Um, and then, you know, so maybe they multiply, maybe they converge, um, who knows? It's going to throw our moral calculus completely out of whack. Um, so they say, you know, sort of typically understating the point, we will need to rethink this principle among others, right, because of this sort of change or this problem. Um, all right, so how do we get super intelligent AI to be good? Well, we're going to achieve super intelligence say, Bostrom Yukowski, by two routes. We might do it by achieving, by redesigning cognition itself. We also might achieve greater intelligence by just increasing the speed. And we've seen this distinction before. Um, so two different ways that we might get these AI systems. And let me just um, pilfer this distinction from Keith Stanovich. Um, we've talked about this before, but I want to formalize it. So we've got two basic kinds of rationality. There's instrumental rationality, which means you're behaving in the world so that you get exactly what you most want, given the resources available to you, or as the optimization of the individual's goal fulfillment. So the idea for instrumental rationality is if you're being instrumentally rational, if you've got a goal, you're pursuing those 
behaviors or those actions that are most effective at achieving your goal. It doesn't evaluate the quality or the more morality or the or the um, you know the the laudability of the goal itself. So if you want to be a really good serial killer, there's an instrumentally rationally instrumentally rational way to do that. There's better and worse ways to do that. So that's what instrumental rationality means. But we also have a notion of epistemic rationality, and that's where we mean having correct beliefs, having true beliefs that map correctly onto the world. And actually, with a uh, artificial general intelligence, you need to have both. I mean, you and I need to have both, too, um, because I need to act, and I want to achieve my goals. And being able to achieve my goals requires that I have true beliefs, right? Um, and so you can see, like in cases we've got in the news right now of people, you know, uh, demanding to be let out of coronavirus lockdown and they want to be able to exercise their freedom to assemble or their freedom to go to church or whatever. And then predictably two weeks later, they get coronavirus and die. Right. So that's a case where somebody's, um, you know, that they had some instrumental rationality that that um, they argued for, you know, they're trying to achieve something. I wanted to go to church or I wanted to be able to go congregate with my friends. Um, so they argue for that goal. But the goal itself was a really bad goal and didn't achieve what they were after. Um, OK, so Stenovich helps there. And we might start thinking now in uh, using Bostrom and Yudkowsky's distinctions about the ways in which superintelligence might be different. So um, I think Yudkowsky had come up with this set of metaphors. There's, th there's three, I think, ways to think about this. Um, we have a metaphor here where we, we can look at each other and we can think about different differences of individual intelligence between humans. So like think about the difference between you and Einstein. Um, so if we think of, um, them being more or less like us, but them being as far beyond us as Einstein is beyond you, then we, then we have these metaphors or these sort of, um, utopian images that come out of, of that metaphor that lead us to think about AIs are going to be able to patent new inventions, publish groundbreaking research papers, make money in the stock market, lead political power blocks and so on. Um, so we can use a, the metaphor of imagining the difference is differences between of intelligence between two humans. Um, we can also think about the differences in intelligence between past and present human civilizations. Uh, so I've kind of already hinted at this with my medieval healer and bubonic plague problem. So fast AI systems will invent capabilities that futurists commonly predict for human civilizations a century or a millennium in the future, like molecular nanotechnology or interstellar travel. So sort of think about the, where the ancient Greeks were in terms of their knowledge and where we are in terms of our knowledge. And imagine then that kind of mapping that analogy up to, okay, well, then we could expect or th imagine that super intelligent AI might be as far beyond us as we are beyond the ancient Greeks. And then third, we might consider the differences between brain architecture between humans and other biological organisms. And I don't think they go nearly as far, far enough here, but um, they pilfered this line from Werner Ving, um, I don't recall which science fiction book that is, but he said, imagine running a dog mind at a very high speed. Would a thousand years of doggy living add up to any human insight? And maybe we can imagine that it would, especially at some very high speed, or it certainly came up with some novel solutions to problems. Um, and, and the, you know, we think of dogs as being dumber than us in some sense, but what we're getting at here is that changes of arch cognitive architecture might produce insights that no human level mind would be able to find or perhaps even represent after any amount of time. So now think about um, dolphin consciousness or dolphin minds or whale minds. And then that Murray Shanahan article that I referred to a few slides back, he starts thinking about alien minds. So um, we think in terms of intelligence of whales, for instance, or octopi or other creatures as being not just less intelligent than us, but also uh, very different than us. So now imagine very different configurations that are more intelligent than us. And now you can start imagining ways in which you get sort of radically different results from um, or d different uh, prospects for having artificial general intelligence working on problems.
Okay, so we're familiar with um, the, the worry that Bostrom has, he's got a whole book on this, uh, that superintelligence poses an existential risk to human beings. Um, and that means where an adverse outcome would either annihilate Earth originating intelligent life or permanently and drastically curtail its potential, right? So it's a very sort of um, academic way of talking about wiping out humanity. Um, or conversely, there's the utopian jackpot that we might get from this uh, invention. A positive outcome for superintelligence could preserve Earth originating intelligent life and fulfill its potential completely, right? So that's all the utopian um, scenarios we imagine. Um, and then they call our attention to uh, what they call a good story bias. Um, and what happens is that we overestimate the probabilities of those scenarios that make for good stories in TV and movies. Um, and Bostrom being an expert, and I've heard, I've seen Russell complain about this too, uh, being an expert on artificial intelligence, inevitably when the science press or the popular press comes and interviews him or talks to him, they will ask him questions and there's always the killer robot Terminator question. And inevitably when they publish their article, they go get a Terminator picture and put it at the top of the article, right? Um, Russell's gotten to the point where he won't even do any interviews because he's so sick of that happening. Well, why, why is that always the first thing on everybody's minds? It's because we've seen so many damn movies with that theme, right? Um, so that makes us elevate the probability of that sort of thing happening Whereas Bostrom, for instance, Yudkowsky are worried about other, you know, not so movie worthy scenarios, but that also might pose uh, existential risk um, to, to the human race. And we've talked about, you know, the sort of paperclip scenarios over the course of the semester. Um, and that's the, the, the avenue down which Bostrom goes. Okay, so now here's a here's something else that you haven't thought about, or you, maybe you didn't reflect about with the sort of the AI, the context of AI ethics. Um, considering the ethical history of human civilizations over centuries of time, we can see that it might prove a very great tragedy to create a mind that was stable in ethical dimensions, along which human civilizations seem to exhibit directional change. What if Archimedes? Had, had been able to create a long-lasting artificial intellect with a fixed version of the moral code of ancient Greece. So look, we've made what we think of as moral progress over the course of the centuries. And um, if we were to ask, for instance, Archimedes or somebody a thousand years ago, if they were building an AI system and you ask them, okay, what is the good life or what is the best way for humanity to live or what's the most moral behavior for this artificial intelligence to pursue, they're going to give a very different answer than what we would, right? Um, and we consider the expansion of the moral circle, as I've been arguing, that, you know, we've seen this progressive expansion where, for instance, in American culture, you know, originally you get um, propertied, uh, uh, moneyed white males are the ones who have the most moral standing, the most political standing, most social standing. And then we've um, steadily expanded the circle of moral consideration. So we include um, and allow women the right to vote, and we expand rights to uh, gay couples to get married, and we expand rights to people of African American descent or African descent, and so on. And then, you know, we've seen the, the Peter Singer article that says, well, you've got to keep expanding that circle out to sentient beings and include, include animals, and therefore you shouldn't be subjugating them to your, um, you know, to your meal. Uh, so we think of that arc as a, a as moral progress. We think of that not as not just change and not just shift, but there's development here that's progress. So if we want an AI system to do the right things, well, there's a time index on that, right? So time do the right things what 21st century right things, uh, 11th century right things, first century right things, or 30th century right things, um, and. And this also gets me sort of worrying about, um, you know, that example. So consider, well, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. So um, Bostrom and Yukowski are worried about, you know, how do you build an AI which when you, uh, when it executes, it becomes more ethical than you. And I mean, one problem here is how do you know it's being more ethical than you? Because it may not, its behavior may not resemble your behavior. I mean, maybe Archimedes would look at us and be baffled by um, our pursuing what we think of as noble or moral or ethical goals. 
And what do you do when it arrives at allegedly ethical conclusions that, t that look nothing like what your 21st century hominid brain thinks are ethical? Um, so what are they getting at here? Uh, here's another long quote. Um, One strong piece of advice that emerges from considering our situation as analogous to that of Archimedes is that we should not try to invent a super version of what our own civilization considers to be ethics. This is not the strategy we, have want, we would have wanted Archimedes to follow. We wouldn't have wanted Archimedes to have imposed some kind of global ancient Greek ethics on all of us. Perhaps the question we should be considering, rather, is how an AI program by Archimedes with no more moral expertise than Archimedes could recognize at least some of our own civilization's ethics as moral progress as opposed to mere moral instability. This would require that we begin to comprehend the structure of ethical questions in the way that we have already comprehended the structure of chess. So the idea here is that um, there's a goal that we have in mind, and we want to figure out what the goal of ethical development is, and we want that AI system to be pursuing that. Now, this has got me um, thinking about a couple things on the side. One is that Russell, again, has got a nice solution in um, our benevolent AI book readings, where he says, look, you solve the control problem by having it be coupled to satisfy human preferences, and then it derives its knowledge of human preferences from human behavior, and you keep it uncertain about what human preferences are, so it has to watch our behavior to figure that out. Um, so that's one way to kind of keep the AI from running off without us. Um, but what if the, the, super, uh, the super intelligent AI moral code uh, appears to be morally repugnant to us? Um, I mean, look, if you had come to some uh, ancient Greek uh, with the notion of modern um, egalitarianism, uh, post uh, French Revolution, modern egalitarianism that says um, ra neither race nor gender make have any moral moral di distinction to make about whether or not a person has moral standing. An ancient Greek would be dumbfounded, be, would be baffled by your notion that slaves, um, uh, that human slaves are uh, are wrong, for instance or some plantation owner in the 1600s, in the, in the, in the, in the, the early uh, American settlers, right? If you had come to someone like that <clears throat> and suggested, hey, in 500 years, we're going to think that not only um, we're, we're going to conclude that it's moral to um, tolerate uh, homosexual relationships and let them get married, and we think that slavery is intolerable, and you, it's it's a, a horribly morally repugnant thing to do, and that women ought to be allowed to vote. That guy would be um, outraged at the suggestion that this is that those are moral conclusions, right? So, uh, I by extension, I'm worried that what if uh, how do we know when an AGI comes back to us with the answer? to how do we build the optimum society, right? And the answer he gives us is, you know, um, dumbfounding or seemingly morally repugnant or seems awful to us, but we've got to sort of trust in the, the conclusions that this thing has drawn because it's viewing things from a 30th century perspective or it's understanding the arc of moral development and it converges on something out there at the limit that's way beyond what we sort of, you know, can... Um, uh, way beyond our kin. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot going on here and a lot, of, a lot of doors get opened up by this sort of playing around with the idea of radically different minds at work on um, human uh, level problems. Okay, so um, the recap here is that they start out by arguing that we need to have sort of responsibility and accountability, transparency, um, auditability, that is we need to be able to know what's going on inside these AI systems and so on um, to um, you know, prevent these horrible outcomes for humans. Um, and we've got this over the horizon problem for building a super intelligent AGI because they're going to come up with solutions to problems that we won't recognize and we won't know, um, at least in the short local term, whether or not the solutions they're coming up with, they may not look like they're the right ones or the good ones because you know, they're coming from an intelligence that's vastly, vastly beyond our own and we don't understand it any more than a caveman would understand your behavior. 
Um, and then they spend some time wondering about the moral status of machines. They come to some very similar conclusions to Schweitz, Gebel, and Garza, but also um, spell out some of these uh, details on the side. And then I've tried to expand on this notion that exotic minds are going to raise novel moral considerations. They focus on speed and prolif proliferation. I want to open up the door to a bunch of other uh, possibilities there. And then we've got this problem about what sorts of um, moral... Uh, norms or moral goals will a uh, ethical, super uh, intelligent AI converge on? What's the character of the ethical being we want to shoot for? And what is the what are the answers that it's going to give to what is the the sort of best human life that we can live?